From Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, this is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today, the director of Showtime's The Comedy Store, Mike Binder. With Gina Grad on news and Bald Brian on sound effects, and now, if he wanted to see elderly people interrupt each other, he'd hang out with his parents. Adam Corolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get it on. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for sharing. We love that about you, right, Gina Grad? That's right. Handball, Brian. Wow. Who is that? Emmanuel Lewis. I, I oh. thought it was Pam Adlon. I <laughs> did, what? too. Oh, no, sorry, Pam Adlon doing Emmanuel Lewis. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, then now <laughs> we... Now it is Webster himself. We all wow. feel... Feel better about ourselves. All right, so we'll talk to uh, Binder about this uh, Comedy Store special, which I'm looking forward to. I haven't seen it yet. I'm in it uh, somewhere. Uh, We got some calls up there. Um, Also, um, Max Zapata has dutifully found some more Slippery Slope guy. Right. So those are always kind of fun. Um, The... uh, as we tape this, they're you know they're gonna have the um, debate tonight. As we as we tape this, and uh, I was hanging around with some people the other uh, last night, and they're trying to figure out who's gonna win. And it's a, it's a wild card because of Trump. And you mean win the debate or win the election? No, win the election. No one. Okay. I don't even know if anyone. We wins all lose anything. the Cause, debate. Because I literally thought I'm like, does, does it matter at this point who wins no. the debate? No, you know, but I said something, and this is what is the wild card to this group. I said, as far as the polling goes, Biden is ahead, and he's he's ahead, you know, nicely, comfortably, safely, I think you, you would call it. Mm-hmm. That's as far as the polling goes. But here's the problem with the polling. Biden's numbers are Biden's numbers. You know, he's not going to go, whatever the poll says Biden's getting, I think that's what he's getting. Mm. Trump has some room over his head to to go up. So Biden is like against the ceiling, which is fine because his ceiling is above Trump's. The real question is, and nobody really knows the answer to this, is, is, is Trump against the ceiling is there two inches or is there five feet? Like, I don't know how much. I know where Biden is. Like, if you said to me, how accurate do you think the Biden polling is? I'd go, seems accurate. He's ahead. But what about Trump? Now, if, if Biden was running against Mitt Romney, I'd yeah. go, OK, he's at 49 percent and Romney's at 47 percent. And I wouldn't picture in the metaphor the room uh, uh, the ceiling height like okay when so, you're when you're hitting the ceiling you're yeah. maxed out right i don't know how much space there is between trump's uh redhead and the actual ceiling and that's right. that's the rub in like a bradley effect kind of way that people aren't be on, being honest with the pre-polling is it, just want to be clear about this yeah like a tom bradley the tom bradley I don't know, Sam Yorty. I can't remember what the oh, deal. I can't, I can't remember right. what the deal was, but uh, people aren't being forthcoming about who's Tom, be voting. Tom Bradley was the mayor of Los Angeles for I don't know, thirty-one years or something. I mean that he has, uh, an, he has an international wing of the airport. I know black uh, black man uh, is was uh, one of the early, I guess, uh, African American mayors. But um, I guess the Bradley effect was. A lot of people said they were voting for Bradley because it's Los Angeles and you're trying to be progressive and you want to be cool. You know, like I'm voting. And then when they got into the booth, I guess they didn't vote for Bradley. So, yes, that Bradley effect. It's not an answerable question. I'm just saying if you look at it this way, uh, Bradley was 73 to 93. Wow. 20 year run, man. If you look at it that way, it's an interesting way to look at it. So, so, um, Biden's ahead, Biden's comfortably ahead. And if he was running against Romney, it'd be a done deal. But the real question is, is does Trump or maybe Trump doesn't move at all, but I, I have question marks. I'm curious how much space there is above his head. 
Yeah, that's the last real question about the within the polling community. I have been weirdly obsessed with the polls and just good or bad or up or down or whatever. And yeah, there's like, is there such thing as the shy Trump voter? The, 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 covering what you're talking about, the Trump voter who will refuse to tell the pollster the truth. I think so. That's a debate we'll see, I guess, in about a week, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an or two weeks. Oh, 10 days. There's a little element of, uh, all right, I run this YMCA, so uh, I'm glad you all gathered here. First off, show of hands, who's a pedophile? Okay. <laughs> okay, zero. Fantastic. Zero. Apt analogy. <laughs> Fantastic. Zero. All right, then we can go camping. Let's do this. But boys, <laughs> get in your underpants. We're going camping. Like Nobody put their hand up. Eh, a couple of those guys out there don't want to raise their hand, I think, is what's going on. Uh, I, yes. I know this. It's going to be funny because by the time you know people hear this, the debate will will be so such old news. But it's funny that we're having someone coming on to talk about the comedy store because all I picture tonight, since the mic is cut off, but that doesn't mean someone's mouth is talking and you can't hear them. It's just going to sound like heckling, like that, yes. heckling. That's a good observation, Jeannie, because a skill these two men are going to have to master quickly, and hopefully, you know, we'll know by the time you'll hear this is. Don't, this is just how it happens in debates. No matter who you are, where you are, what level, you're going to go over time and to finish your thought. It just happens. But mm -hmm. you're going to sound like an idiot if you're still talking when the mic goes to mute. Right. So you got to hit, you got to hit the post, uh, as we uh, know in the uh, radio industry. Right. Well, maybe we should do it like the comedy store back in the day, which is we'll have a head, we'll have a, a caricature of Eddie Cantor's head, and when it <laughs> lights up, you got to tell your last joke yeah. and get off yeah. get off the stage. Wind it down. All right. So let's see. Um, so Max Apatis got some slippery slope guys, which uh, I think translates into the uh, audio world pretty pretty easily. I don't know which. Uh, where'd you find these things, Max Apata? There's some on YouTube, and, and it should be noted that a lot of people think these come from the mansion, but they actually come from your late night show. You had a lot right. as long with the 1780s guy. Right. These were bumpers. Yeah, exactly. So, here, let's listen to one. You, you went head to head, Kimmel. All right. Let's <laughs> we know how that worked out. All right. This one is going to be Animal Rights. And now, an editorial from Slippery Slope Guy on animal rights. Do I think animals should suffer unnecessarily? Of course not. But it's a slippery slope. The next thing you know, those baby wipes you thought were safe have permanently disfigured your infant son. While Wiggles the rabbit is living on government-subsidized cabbage, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. I love the turn. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I had to work the turn to the other camera in on the uh, on the move. All right, we got another one? Yeah, I got a, I got flag burning here. Let me... Uh... Oh, wait, didn't we do flag... I think we did that. We oh, did sorry, uh, medical marijuana. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, load this up here. <clears throat> oh, an editorial from Slippery Slope Guy on medical marijuana. Does marijuana have some medical value? Maybe, but it's a slippery slope. First, your doctor's prescribing pot for your mother's glaucoma. Then he's treating your kid's head lice with hashish. And the next thing you know, a gang of government-funded hippies has stormed your house and forced your infant to mainline a speedball, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. <laughs> Those horrible. acting shots. I was gonna say, that's the most passionate I think I've ever seen you. <laughs> <laughs> the crescendo. Is I had really... a lot of energy back then. It was my youth. All right, do you have one more? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not ready. I got a little. Okay, because uh, burning the uh, flag was one we already got. All right, we got some calls up there. So let's see. Uh, wants to talk about satisfaction, volunteering, coaching. Good, because um, I got an article that's uh, sort of on the heels of that. Uh, Victor, 38, upstate New York. Hey, what's up, guys? going on let's talk about uh, satisfaction and volunteering and coaching yeah i'm piggybacking off of your discussion yesterday with how you just called that lady out of the blue and it was satisfying uh, i get i get the same feeling from coaching little kids especially right now yeah the lady the lady i called had a, a terminally ill child and i just called her yes that call thank you yeah yes 
doing the free stuff, you right. know, it's satisfying. Um, but, uh, like right now, kids are stuck in class or at home all day. Um, especially, you know, during all this quarantine stuff and they need to get out there. They need that, that good role model out, out in, um, out in the world. And I think coaching sports is a great way for the parents and the kids to really get a, get that satisfaction. The, um, the, 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 you cannot underestimate the the value of organized sports at a young age. And as a matter of fact, whenever I sort of think about people and I kind of critique them and I sort of see how they are as adults or employees or just whatever, it always gets back to that. Did they play a lot of sports? Were they in ROTC? Were they involved with a bunch of disciplines, you know? Because, I don't know, I, I, how would you expect a dog to act? You know, my, my dog, Phil, is, I don't know, five or six years old. He's a lazy piece of unbridled shit now. And he was when he was two because we never really coached him up. You know what I mean? He just didn't. He just is who he is. Why would he be? Why would you expect someone to go through life with no coaching, no discipline, no no repetition, no drilling, you know, none of that stuff. And then somehow they're 28 and they're su- supposed to be model employees. Like, why would they be? Right. They're stuck in a state of arrested development for whenever they didn't get that, you know, crucial coaching, leadership, guidance, whatever. Well, also, like, is it even arrested development? It's like, I don't know how to play the piano. And the answer to why I don't know how to play the piano is no one ever taught me how to play the piano. It'd be insane to think I could play the piano. Just like, you're an adult, Adam. You're smart. You like music. Like, yeah, but I, don't, I don't know how to do this thing. I never, I, no one ever taught it to me. Why, why would it be that much different if you really think about like a discipline or, you know, that, that sort of motivation, that discipline, that self-reliance or that teamwork? You know, how, why would you be good at teamwork if you never were on a team? That's a really good point because we've actually bumped up against this exact thing with the five-year-old who is is used to us saying, you know, sometimes like, oh, it's okay. You don't know how to do it because kids don't know how to do that. You know, I'm a grown-up. I know how to do that. But that there, there's a whole swath in the middle that we we failed to tell him. So, you know, when he's trying to kick a soccer ball, he doesn't know how. He goes, well, I'll just know how when I'm a grown-up. And I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I meant... I've had all these years to practice doing the thing I'm doing. So that's why I know how to do it now. Yeah. He just thinks it'll just come. I literally just had this conversation. Brian. What's interesting, I'm going to give Gina a compliment here. Uh, what's interesting is, it, like, of course, sports is the easiest way for this to manifest itself. But, like, Gina, you did theater for God knows how many years. Mm-hmm. You learned all the same things. Responsibility to the group. Right. You got to learn your lines. Teamwork. Yep. Uh, accountability. All this, Showing up on time. You know, That's putting right. in the work. All these things that you learn through You're on time. Sports, you're late. Exactly. All these things you learn through sports, which, of course, is the sort of most structured, easiest way to right. get them. You can learn it through with learning an instrument, a theater, you know, yeah. so many different disciplines. Sure. Oh, yeah. It's just it's it's really just a discipline with an attempt at mastery and repetition. Uh, that's that's really that's really all this is. The, um, the you know, the part that I, I realize is so kind of misleading and so many humans get caught up in this world, which is when you're nine, you go, well, when I'm grown up, you're physically saying like grown up when I'm bigger and I'm stronger, like I'm an adult, I will then know this or be able to perform this or do this. And it's, it's true that your body will change, but your, your mind is not going to change that much if you're not doing these, these activities or these disciplines. And I think a lot of people, at least I went to junior high and high school with a lot of these people, where they just kind of thought being an adult just meant, I think, I think the way they looked at it is like you were, it was like a vegetable garden, you know, and like you start off as a seed and then you're a little sapling. And then at some point I'm, I'm going to have big ears of corn hanging off of mm-hmm. me. And, uh, but the reality is, is. You will grow up. You will that all that stuff will physically happen, but you don't have to bear any fruit. Hold on. 
You really don't. You can just physically grow up. You can be like a garden that just grows, but there's yeah. no harvest. Like, there's never a harvest. You think about all the guys I went to high school with. Oh, they grew up, but there's no harvest day. No harvest. No, because they were just figuring, well, once I grow up and I become this big stock, then uh, then I'm, I can do what I want. It's like, yeah, but not if you never had any training or any education or any experience or any dedication. Yes, Brian. Now, footnote, you mentioned uh, when you uh, described the, uh, per, the the fan of the show you talked to, Olga's uh, friend, um, that you get out of it what you put in. It's so gratifying to just take that time and do it. I, I coached uh, youth uh, sports. I did two years of coaching uh, JV football. It's one of the best jobs I ever had. I loved it. I look forward to it. I got paid like some little amount. I, I, could have, I would have given it back. Yeah, you know what I mean? It was just that much. I got that much out of it. Agreed. Hey, Victor, thanks for volunteering. What sport? It's not soccer, is it? Uh, well, I do pretty much every whatever the kids are but, playing. But, but I do not, a little soccer, but not, a little... but not, not, not soccer. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, flag football, baseball, oh. basketball, whatever uh, the kids uh, are into right now. Yeah, I don't need a new generation of soccer players. So I got to say that the the flag football thing. I was uh, when my son did it. I was fairly disgusted. Fairly you would much disgusted. rather have a soccer playing son than a flag football. Yeah, player, so. I was disgusted. Same because the thing that dis- uh, you know. By the way, this is why I'm the worst person to watch anything with. Like these kids were 11, 12 years old. You know, like twelve years old. They're out there in the middle of the field, and the coach is in the huddle with them. And like when I was twelve years old, I was. In my fifth year Pop Warner football, we were in bantams. We were signaling in plays from the sideline. They were running plays in, like alternating the guards. The co- we were calling snap counts and doing, you know, hook and ladder moves and and uh, Statue of Liberty and all that kind of stuff. Like mean, we had trick plays. Like nice. we we kicked extra points. We kicked field goals. Like we went out and fucking executed. Like I was the captain of the defensive team and they were like flashing signs like six one four two gap eight and there were i was communicating them with them with hand signals from the middle of the field like the fucking coach wasn't standing out in the middle of the field with all of us Ugh. Blah. anyway it's so insane that uh, my son has never played. Oh, there's Sonny catching a football. Look at that. Oh, to go on airborne. It. Yeah. It's so With ins- the gloves. It's, of course. It's so insane that my son has never played Pop Warner football when my entire life all I've said is the only thing that saved my life was Pop Warner football. It was the most important thing in, in my entire life. And my son has never put on, uh, strapped on the shoulder pads or the helmet. Well, to be fair to him, he doesn't need his life saved. He's That's, living pretty good. Oh, he's... It's got the Vita Loca thing going 24-7, yeah. that boy. Just from the picture, I'm going to say prototypical uh, possession receiver. Yes. Not, not, not a lot of yak. <laughs> well, you know, I would sell him as uh, not a lot of flat-out foot speed, but super lazy. There you go. <laughs> That'd be my pitch for Sonny as a possession receiver. All right. Let's see. we got some calls up there. We've got uh, You can bring the, the monitor back. Sorry, I can't see the calls out up there and if you have a if you have a slippery slope guy you can uh, pull that as well let's see i, I have a slippery slope. oh you guy. do yeah All you right. want to watch it sure i'm a... i'm fucking in lo- i i don't know which one i love more slippery slope guy or 1780s guy but they make me laugh and they're they're all 28 seconds so how bad could they be all right this one's gun control gun control slippery slope guy on gun control does gun control make sense maybe but it's a slippery slope First, they outlaw the 40-round banana clip. Then they take away your son's BB gun. And the next thing you know, jackbooted government thugs are surrounding your house, and you're left to defend your family with a spork, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. (laughs) Were these all one-take wonders? Yeah, I think we would uh, just write up like 20 of them, and I would would just do them in a row and turn. probably do a take or two I, I don't remember doing that many takes on it we just shot it on a sound stage and just put that desk down and i just i didn't know i i don't know where I even got the well i know where i got the idea i've been complaining about slippery slope guy for a long time uh we have an ant guy on here and boy oh. do we need an ant guy i gotta tell you 
I said to Lynette today, I said, there's goddamn ants in my office. There are ants all over the outside by the pool. We woke up this morning. There were ants in the kitchen. And when I was driving, as I was driving and looking at over one of my buck slips, or I'm always frantically jotting down notes, it's either jokes or things to do or whatever it is. As I'm driving my car, I look over and there's an ant on my passenger seat because it was on my buck slip. And there's not a goddamn thing you can. So, and I'm like, what the fuck with the ants? And OK, so we um, can. Uh, sorry, uh, Scott over here from New Jersey is going to give us a satisfying ant answer. Unlike our last query into this. Scott, 50, New Jersey. <clears throat> Adam, get it on. Thanks. Bill, Hi, you guy. Know how you're doing. I'm. I'm going to try to do better than the last guy. The last guy was painful. I know. Uh, the ants are, are, are large con- uh, colonies. They're like an army. You don't send the whole army out. You only send certain certain ants out to get food. So you got to attack the colony. The only way to do that is to put bait out. you got to put bait out so the ants bring the bait. It's either in a gel form or a granular form back to the colony and then when they eat it at the colony, that's how you kill them. If you spray the ones you see and kill them, they're not bringing anything back to the colony, to the base, right? to, to, to put a dent on the colony. All so right. you have to put granular bait or the gel out. The gel's like a uh, cork. You can put it right in the corners because the ants like to walk you know, along the corners and stuff, and they'll bring it right back to the, right back to the nest. You're never going to get rid of them, but you'll, you'll, you'll do, that's the best way to control them. Right, so get the gel. What about those little gel sort of clear little houses? Those oh, yeah, little... I have those. That's, that's, that's one right now. Yeah. That's per- that, that, that's perfect. Yeah, because that, that's a bait. They're bringing it back to the colony. Yeah, they got to bring it. They got to bring it back. I, I was thinking to myself, killing what... them, killing yeah. them, the ones you see, is, is, is really going to do nothing. You have to get it back Beetle. to the colony. All right, but once once they're in your car and you're more than eleven miles from your home. I think it's okay to kill them, right? There's no way they're finding their way back to the colony at that point, or is that okay? Okay. It's like gambling at sea. Once was, you're 11 miles out, right? You you're in international now waters. We're talking. I, uh, I, was, I always think about what horrible ants my friends from high school would make because there wouldn't be any bringing it you back to the colony. <laughs> they'd just be if they found food, they'd fucking eat that food where they were and just die. You'd never yeah. get rid of the colony with Ray and Chris. That's for goddamn sure. All right. Let's see. Um, we got, uh, mm-hmm. oh, we got, uh, each your feelings will do after the break, right, uh, Max Pat? Yep. Let me hit uh, LifeLock here. October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Remember, if you connect it, protect it. Take proactive steps to enhance your cybersecurity. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives. Every day, we put our information at risk on the Internet. You can miss certain threats by uh, just monitoring your credit alone. Good thing. There's LifeLock. LifeLock detects a wide range of identity threats, like your social security number for sale on the dark web. If they detect your information, they will send you an alert. So protect yourself. Get the industry standard. It's almost 2021, people. Get yourself some LifeLock, right, Dawson? No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. LifeLock can see threats you might miss on your own. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year by using promo code ADAM. Call 1-800-LIFELOCK or head to LifeLock.com. Use promo code ADAM for 25% off. All right, uh, Max Pata, on the heels of uh, volunteering in the uh, for the coach job, uh, I had an article that I liked, which is uh, the importance of uh, working for free, which is something I've always had a problem with because we've sort of declared this war on, like, interns and you shouldn't be working mm-hmm. for free and this sort of notion where it's like, well, you, you show up at the company – and all you're doing is getting these guys coffee and going on runs to Staples. Like, oh, okay, yeah, right. What do you want them to do? Operate the gantry crane? They're fucking 19. They don't know what the fuck they're doing. It's like, yes, they are getting coffee. Yes, they are going to Staples. And they're basically acclimating themselves. Like we were talking about, Gina, you were talking about acclimation with the food, with right. the dough, 
with that yep. world. I was talking about acclimation with the hardwood flooring. You have to put mm-hmm. it in its environment. You are acclimating. You're getting into that environment and you're acclimating. The first and most important thing you're doing is when the boss walks down the hall, he doesn't go, who the fuck are you? He goes, hey, Bob. Hey, John. Hey, Steve. Hey, Susie. You know, like he knows you're there. Right. So I, this this notion of uh, that's it's the the best thing you could do is work for free. And when uh, when people go, um, well, yeah, but what if you can't afford it? You can't afford not to work for free. That's what this wow. podcaster has to say. So you have that article. Yeah. Sorry. So this was sent to you, um, and it was an article by Jonathan Bales from his site Lucky Maverick, and he's like a fantasy sports expert, statistician. And it, the 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 main points are you need to work for free. Uh, more often because it provides value to the maximum number of people uh, the, the more you work for free. And, like, for instance, Adam, you have that great story about Michael Naren who used to do all those animations and drawings for you in Loveline, and he provided value to you, and now he worked for free for you, and now he's that family guy. I walked yeah. that mf right into family guy m- moments, I don't mean moments, but two hours before his flight at LAX, I just said, we're, we're going up to Family Guy. And we just, I walked him right in there. I said, you need to hire this guy. Here's what he does. Showed him some of his stuff. The guy was like living in mama's basement on the East Coast. And he's up here living large now at the Family Guy. And every time I'd go in there, I'd just see him now. He's got all the I don't know what you call them, but proofs and all the rough stuff, you know, all this, he, he's got all the episodes before they become episodes. And I don't know what that guy's uh, pulling down a year, but I'm guessing he's making great money. Family guy. If anyone's ever been yeah. in there, it's one big ping pong tournament and a kitchen filled with food and fucking big time celebrities just kind of waltzing through the place. I mean, it is a, you know, this close to being Pixar in terms of a work environment he loves his job, and it's only because he did all those, all those bits for us for free for all those years. So, yeah, sorry, Max Spanner. Yeah, and then other ideas he talked about was, uh, do you know who works for free all the time are entrepreneurs, and who the people who never work for free but gets paid for every hour they put in are employees. Right. So if you yeah. – and he, yeah, so he has this really good chart that kind of just shows the difference between – uh, and I'll put it up on the screen here and we'll put it on adamcroll.com of just the value over time for uh, just in months for entrepreneurs and employees. Entrepreneurs will start lower, but they have a much higher ceiling because they, they would work for free and once again have a maximum value, uh, have maximum value to a maximum number of people. Working for free is a form of gambling. It can be extremely beneficial or be a giant waste of time, but when done properly, it's trading in the sure thing for a lower chance of short-term success, but disproportionate future re- rewards when things go your way. And also, you know, the stuff that doesn't work, you know, the millions and millions of show ideas or movies or pitches I've done. I've done pitches and pitches and drive across here and go to Apple and go to Sony and pitch and pitch and pitch. And it's like never got paid, cost a lot in gas, took up a lot of time. But I learned something at all those meetings. You know, you, you go, well, so if nothing comes of it, well, then it was a waste. But it's like, well, what is nothing? Like you, you, you got better at pitching. You got in a room with people. You under you, you, you got the pro. You got you were involved with the process. Like how could it, how could it be nothing? Nothing is yeah. staying in bed. Well, and on the micro and macro of what you just said, what you experienced and being an intern, if you didn't learn anything, that's kind of on you. It's true. Agreed. Uh, Adam, you declared eighteen months ago on this very show you were done going to pitches. I am. Fuck because it. he learned. Fuck <laughs> He learned. Fuck them. <laughs> oh, I went to 10,000 and thank God the Zoom thing. Thank God everything, everything's just gone Zoom now. But yes, it was a, it was, it, it, at the stage I was at in my career, it was, it was a waste. It is not a waste depending on what stage you're at. But just sure. like I wouldn't go, you know, put my resume in for, you know, a local morning zoo radio thing, just not at the stage I'm at. But, uh, yes, I, uh, I've still been to 10 fucking thousand pitches 
<laughs> and there's no more I could learn about pitches other than all executives are fucking assholes with no imagination and zero respect for the art of comedy. <laughs> That's what I learned. I learned that they're pompous, arrogant, overpaid dillweeds who don't who put their foot through a fucking Rembrandt. That's what I learned. Wow. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. <laughs> That's good. All right, let's see. Let me just blow through our last two calls here, and then we'll get to uh, Gina's mm. Gina's offering. There's a toaster oven here. Does that have anything to do with Gina's oh. offering? No, fortunately oh, not. Emmy heated his lunch. Oh, <laughs> yeah. what the... You we know, have to work this out that that we can have do a drop off because this is insane. And just talking. Who about knew it. the workplace was going to turn into like? I, uh, I tripped over someone's hibachi. Who was that? Steve's <laughs> brining. Steve's <laughs> brining. Chris started it by boiling meat. Well, yeah, I I, uh, I stepped out of the studio and I kicked a crock pot. Who's who's got it? No, that's a slow cooker. What, what, what is this thing where everyone's bringing in toaster ovens and hibachis uh, and sous vide uh, slow cookers? Ooh, and this I, is I work. I just got an air fryer. I can drop it off. It, God damn it! Microwave. The pot. They have Subway. It's a place called Subway. It's here for a reason. It's so you don't have to unpack your fucking kitchen into your place of work. You know who do we blame, Gina? Who do we blame for this? I hope it's not me. No, it's your best oh. friend, Domagoy. <laughs> oh. How I fucking put that one at your feet and you you Sorry. punted it like Charlie I Brown. Would, in a million years, I wouldn't have thought about Domagoy again for the rest of my life. You're right. You're right. Domagoy. Domagoy. He's a guy we used to work with at KLSX. I, no, first things first. <laughs> no one knows. He's like... He's like the legend of that song, Big John. You got to find that song, Big John. No one knows where he came from. No one knows what he did. He has no origin. It turns out he may have turned a, he may have uh, gotten a fight over a Cajun queen and sent a Louisiana <laughs> man down. packing. Uh, he's from with Parts a, Unknown. He's from Parts he is, Unknown. Croatia. He, he literally killed a man in Louisiana, and that's all I know. I don't know what his job was. Big Dom. Every morning at the mine, you could show over the crock pot. Got Louise and Rice and Cajun beans. Shoulder and narrow it to hip, and everyone knows. Didn't give no lip to Big Dom. Big Dom. Big Dom. Big Dom. Big Bad Dom. Big Dom. Nobody seemed to know where John called home. He just killed a man over a bouillon cube. Didn't he show up to work to early right. two yeah, hours so he could cook his lunch in front of the other shows. Guns. Somebody said he came from New Orleans with three Tupperware and some <laughs> cream. Fresh and blow from a huge right hand sent a Louisiana fella to the promised land. Big John. Big Dom. Big John. Big Dom. Keep going, Dawson. This is making me laugh. Uh, he cooked Big in our kitchen the whole time at, at Kayla Sex. Zesty flavors and scents from all over. Then well, we all tried to tell him, but Dom didn't care that his staging area was our production office. <laughs> through the kitchen right through the window, we saw him cooking gravy. Big John. Big the Dom. Smoke of this Big Dom. Big hell walk the giant of a man the miners knew well. Grabbed with a Ken, timber, gave with out a uh, George Foreman like grill. A tree, and a, just stood there alone. Big, Big Dom. Dom. All right. I'm tired of my own premise, but that guy came in. That guy cooked his ass off every day. A lot I always, of curries, a lot of za'atar. Jesus Christ. Well, it, it, I, I, do you guys feel... savory dishes. I know. I feel breakfast... <laughs> breakfast is... A, is you know, they say it's the most important meal of the day. I think it's the most intimate meal of the day. Mm. It's it's the only thing you eat without your bra on. You know what I mean, Gina? Amen. Gotcha. Yes. And you kind of, you know, you're in your sweatpants, no shoes, yeah. you know, maybe you maybe up. a little chubby from the night before. Like, it's it's an sure. intimate food. You know what I mean? Lunch, yeah. that's for everybody. You go out to lunch, everyone watches you eat lunch. Lunch truck, eating lunch, dinner, all that. It, brunch, fine. Breakfast is is personal. So that yeah. to, to that point, yeah, bro, uh, lunch and dinner often catches catch can. You know, let's order something, let's grab something on the go in between meetings or whatever. Breakfast is like it's ritualistic. You have the same yeah. thing every day for the most part. Right. 
and they usually don't involve curry <laughs> or garbanzo beans. Or at, at least not in the mid Wilshire area. <laughs> but Dom would drag all that shit in, put it all, set it all up, and then explain, yeah, it's eating breakfast. He would bring That's ingredients right. to salad dressing in separate <laughs> shit and mix it at the table. Oh, yeah. He was ahead of his time, he man. Was, he was like the professor. Did you raw egg in a Caesar dressing. He was like the professor he from side Caesar. Yeah. He was like the professor from the Gilgan's Island show. It's just, <laughs> you know, you can go outside and buy a sandwich, don't you? You can get off the island. You don't have to make everything out of coconuts right here. He was a survivalist. Jesus Christ. Did what? I ever tell you that for his birthday one year, his parents gave him a chicken? No. A live chicken as a pet. Oh God, that sounds. I'm su- I'm surprised he didn't gut it right there where we did our <laughs> post show meetings. Oh. Anyway, so Amy uh, brings in his toaster oven, right? Well, that's the studio's toaster oven. It's actually buried underneath. Oh, he like, pulls it out. He pulls it out. Yeah. So he dusts off the toaster oven, uh-huh. leaves the fucking door open, which says uh, "open for business" to uh-huh. me. Then I'm riding in. And Chris is like, we're doing Eat Your Feelings. And I go, oh, good, I'm starving. And then I think, oh, no, Gina does them remotely now. And then I walk in, I see this this toaster oven presenting itself to me. And I go, oh, they figured out a way to bring the mountain to Mohammed. This is going to be good, but just bad timing with the toaster oven. Huh? Yeah. All right. If it's any consolation, see. I feel terrible right now. No. I mean, good. All right. Clean the screen up. Uh uh, Mike, uh, sorry, Ben from Michigan and uh, Sam from Philly. Sorry, we're going to take a break. We'll come right back. We'll do Eat Your Feelings right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Hey, Adam. Gina was just talking about little people that are really good at eating contests. When I was in college, I was on the rowing team and we would have mixers with the women's softball team. And we had a little competition called a boat race. You line up eight guys and eight women, and everyone had to chug a beer sequentially, and whoever finished first was the winner. Never have a chugging contest against a women's softball team. They are animals. Get it on. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. All right, Gina, what kind of splendid offering have you provided for us? Something I know you'll love. Gina Grads, Eat Your Feelings, brought to you by Home Chef. It's time for Eat Your Feelings. Do some healthy eating with Gina's Restaurant. So thank all of the gods and everything you pray to that the heat wave seems to be broken, knock on wood. And there's a little, I wouldn't say a chill in the air, but the temperature is definitely coming down. We might get some rain this weekend. And it was perfect timing because I did one of Home Chef's chowders. I love a chowder, a clam chowder, a whatever. I don't know anyone who doesn't. And I'd love to show you the picture that they sent me. But unfortunately, the uh, we had some water on the counter and it, the menu got I, stuck to the counter. I, if, if you tell me you don't like chowder, we can't hang. Absolutely. I will, I will judge a man. Also, I'm open to corn chowder, clam chowder. You put whatever. You put chowder at the end. I'm, I'm down. I'm glad you said that because that's one of the points. I I realized two very important things while making Home Chef's chowder, which they said was intermediate. Um, It's not. It was it was pretty simple, Um, I think, because you have to boil something. Maybe they they thought they wanted to go easy on people, but it was very easy. Did you guys. Sorry. One of the staples as I now comb through the wreckage of my past is the Campbell's soup chowder. That's another, because, that's another thing I'm going to get into. Because you you would add milk to it versus yeah. water, and right. it just seemed like, oh, uh, that seems better than that's just gourmet. essentially tap water just filling up mm-hmm. the the pot. But, yes, my, my, <laughs> my young life could be sectioned off into Kraft mac and cheese, 
the Campbell's chowder can mm-hmm. and then uh, hungry man, you know, chicken, yep. chicken, chicken, dinner. fried chicken dinner. Yeah, go ahead. That's right. So this was a scallop and corn chowder with crispy jalapenos. Mm. I don't know what scallop. genius thought to put these together, but I commend them. I have some pictures as well. I cooked this. It took me about 25 minutes from uh, soup to nuts. No, and talk. it was a scallop chowder. Now, that was my, fir- my first point is kind of what Adam was saying. Show the other pictures as well. Um, we, the collective, all of us, never, ever, ever have to open a can of chowder again for the rest of our lives. I've never made a chowder before now. It was so good you would you wouldn't feed canned chowder to your dog anymore after you make it yourself all you need cream water broth and fixins that's it that's your chowder and i couldn't eat this fast enough now first of all this one did have potatoes in it i can't tell you the last time i had a potato but um but if i were making it i would have probably used a little almond flour a little cauliflower no 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 we're doing it their way and it was so scrumptious um do you so, remember brian yes. you remember the three stooges when mo would call everyone chowder heads <laughs> oh i do i grew up hey, on that. Head, i did punk. come on chowder <laughs> i don't know why that's gone the way the dodo i don't Dude, think... i'm guess oh go sorry. ahead i'm guessing this is intermediate because of the scallops scallops are tricky you gotta brown those guys without like you know making them tough yeah and you know they it, it it's really just a minute or two on each side it didn't even take seasoning you just want to brown them up and toss them in the bowl this the ingredients for this one had potato corn onion um and then you know the broth and scallops it was very simple and then there was this fun little uh crispy jalapeno garnish to put over the top but very simple it, the way you want it to be if you order it at a restaurant this is what you expect now clam chowder is what we all know and it's delicious and there's no problem there but i would like to submit that the scallop adds a sweetness that you didn't know you were missing until you put it in a soup like this delicious soft sweet creamy the weather's changing, and I want to thank Home Chef so much for making me realize for the first time that cans are for for everybody else. We don't do cans anymore. We make it fresh, and thank you to Home Chef for letting me uh, figure that out, even in my older age. Yeah, I've never uh, I've never made a move on chowder. Oh. And I've always think of it as a can, but it's just it's no. just cream. I mean, cream, the basis is water, cream, broth, and broth. Yeah. And a lot of times, a lot of recipes call for flour to thicken it into like a roux. This didn't have flour. So this did have potatoes, which is a starch, which is a natural thickener. And I used a potato masher just to get it creamier. But um, thank you. But you can use a coconut flour and almond flour. And you just don't want it to be soupy. You know, you want it to have some thickness to it. But there's plenty of ways to do that without using flour. And please, this season, let's all make a promise to each other. Don't sleep on chowder. All right, let's bring it uh, home here. Beat your feelings. Do some healthy eating. With Gina's recipe. Brought to you by Home Chef. Yeah, thanks, Home Chef. You can visit homechef.com slash Adam. Here's a thought had me thinking about food. I was... uh, invited over to Dave Rubin's house for dinner last night in the uh, Rubin Report. That Dave Rubin, very nice guy, friendly guy, invited a few of us uh, over. And uh, I was talking to his husband, and his husband was very nice guy. David. Yes. <laughs> so it's it, <laughs> man, confusing. It is the risk you take when you go gay. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a roll of the dice. You could have two <laughs> one, guys one named Dave. <laughs> Yeah, the other's hepatitis C. and yeah. But the point is, is he was telling me just how into cooking he was. He's an incredible cook. David is puts me to shame. He is really, really like chef level. That's that's what he said. He said he's fuck of a lot better than you are. That's yeah, as, no, as I recall. Right. <laughs> and he was he was also he's that guy where you go fuck. I wish I was gay. Like he goes, he goes. We, we didn't have we didn't have a lot of money when we were living in New York. So, like, I would go down to the restaurant and I'd, like, take a picture of what was on the menu and then I'd go back to the apartment and try to, you know, recreate it, you know. And I was like, God, I fucking love that. Super sweet couple. And uh, so we ate. 
got a big Wagyu uh, side of beef and threw it on the on the broil on the char broiler. Actually, um, Dave Rubin was in charge of the grill. But anyway, fantastic, real gourmet meal. Loved it. Great conversation, so on and so forth. Um, the subject came up, which is um, being gay, and uh, you know whether it's a decision. And nobody there believes it's a decision, but there are people out there that believe it's a, a decision. And we were sort of laughing that some people think it's a decision when it seems so clearly not, you know, so clearly out of your control. And I said, how about this point for it not being a decision? Forget about being gay. Within the, he- within the heterosexual community, some guys love tits. Some guys are just fucking tit guys. Some guys are ass guys. Some guys like tall chicks. Some guys like curvy. Like, I don't like the big, round, big, bulbous ass sort of Kardashian. Like, that's not my thing. That's not a choice. I'm not making a choice. That's who I am. And, and the guy who loves the big, bulbous ass, that's, he's not, we're not deciding that. It's not a choice at all. I mean, just within the heterosexual community, whether you like the blondes or the brunettes or the sort of dark skin exotics or the busty gals or the curvy gals or the thick gals or the thin gals. I don't think it's ever been. I don't know any guy who's made that decision. It just is. Is there anybody, you know, any male, you know, who weaned himself off of. Uh, a, a big ass and got himself onto a bony ass or something. As like a conscious choice. No, of course not. No, I mean you think about what everyone what everyone likes. Like if you went, if you went and looked up everyone's you uh, porn history, oh that, boy, yeah, that would be what they like. Called perverted justice. And, and there shall there shall be no deviation from that. That is it. Nobody made a choice. Did anyone make a choice? Does anyone feel? like they made a choice in that department as to what they're attracted to. No, it's what you're into. You know, I know guys that like, you know, the, we all know the guy that likes Asian chicks, like, you know, the yellow fever and they can air quotes. That's just, some guys are into that and you're not going to talk them into or out of it. Right. Or just the parts, eyes, yeah. saps. But the, 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 but the point is well, this. Hey, Adam, I, I go for the smile. The, the, the point is, the point is this. If that's not a choice, even within heterosexuality, we don't get a choice, then how could you get a choice beyond that? that that's my argument. Everyone thought that was, that was a decent argument. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Of course, I just ate $70 worth of those homo's beef. What the <laughs> fuck was I going to do? Tell them how I truly felt? Uh. Come on. All right, we have another uh, slippery uh, slope guy. Oh, we have gay marriage. Yeah. Holy oh, shit, we're just sitting around talking about being finally. married. I felt that this was a... Uh... Appropriate. Now, an editorial from Slippery Slope Guy on gay marriage. Should all people have the same rights and privileges under the law? Sure. But it's a slippery slope. First, it's two fellas tying the knot. Then the next thing you know, a guy wants to marry a donkey or a shoe buffer or a vending machine. And there's not a damn thing we can do about it. Shoe buffer. (laughs) <laughs> the fellow wants to marry shoe buffer. <laughs> All right. I miss those two. All right. Uh, we got uh, Mike Binder who did, well, he's done many movies, many big movies, but he's done the, the Comedy Store documentary, The Five-Parter. So he's on hold. So we'll take a quick break. We'll come back with Mike right after this. Adam Carollas, I'm your emotional support animal navigating our all-woke, no-joke culture, has over a thousand five-star reviews on Amazon. Here's one. I must admit that ordering the book after hearing Mr. Carora say this my dream publisher of world touch, I was curious, and it was so the prolable so glad and read it. Dude, solid. You got to read the book. Pick up I'm Your Emotional Support Animal, navigating our all woke, no joke culture, and leave your five star review on Amazon. Get all the links at adamcarolla.com. Mike Binder is back on the show. He's uh, directed the docu series, The Comedy Store, five parter. Episode four airs this Sunday, 10 p.m. on Showtime, and you can watch them on demand at uh, show.com as well. Never seen before footage and uh, all the big names. Good to see you, Mike. 
Good to see you. Thanks for having me on the program. My uh, my pleasure. Um, what is the what's going on at the comedy store right now? And it, are they going to be able to sort of stay stay afloat during this pandemic? No, right now it's an Ebola testing center. Is what it basically <laughs> oh. is. It's um, no, it's shut down. No, but actually they do have a the front bar is open on the patio. As you know, they have a great patio bar. They, they, although Sunday night they have the back patio open. They, they're show, they're actually showing the um, show in the back. You can watch it on a big screen. But for some reason, the people, the great people of California, don't think that live entertainment is an essential business and live comedy is an essential business, which they're dead wrong. And um, they even set up a way that they could. Sh- have tables and chair, chairs and everything outside. And they, they shut them down after about two days. It was a big success. People came, sold out, I guess, both nights. And they just, the, the county shut them down, you know? But so now it's just, some nights I think they, they actually do some shows through the front window and people in the bar can look up and, and see you and hear you, the guy, the comics, you know, but it's a uh, it's a sad state of affairs. God, it, I saw a story the other night where somebody got busted. I think it was in New York because they were a cafe kind of store o- owner, and they left their front door open. I saw that. And they left their fucking door open, and somebody from the city came in to uh, give them a summons. I got to tell you, people, uh, I don't want to sound like slippery slope guy, but we're we are crossing some. We're crossing some bridge here that we are going to wish we never fucking crossed. We are crossing a bridge where we are letting fucking full retards like Gavin Newsom and that total fucking pussy Garcetti and all these other fucking pencil pushing dicks run our fucking lives. And we're going willy nilly along. We're acting like, oh, it's the right thing to do. No, we're good citizens. No, we're you've done a real good thing. Don't wish me out into the cornfield, Gavin Newsom. The sad part, it's not what fucking Gavin Newsom is doing. It's what all the fucking sheep are doing behind him. We should be I rebelling. You, Adam. Yes. The, the, I live in Santa Monica. The other night I'm sitting on my front porch and this guy walk on, on, not on my side of the street, on the sidewalk on the far side, walks by with a mask on. He walks by and a few minutes later he comes back and he goes, hey, you need to put a mask on. And I went, I'm smoking a cigar. <laughs> And I'm on my front porch and it took you 10 minutes to figure out that you needed to come back, get moving, (laughs) you know, but it was like, it was, was, wow, this is what we've come to, you know, what are you doing, man? I'm just, (laughs) if you're going to hassle someone outdoors for not wearing a mask, uh, go ahead and pull your mask down, put a fucking pistol in your mouth and blow your fucking <laughs> retarded head off, please. In the name of society, if you're older than 25 and you do that, please eat a fucking bullet. You fucking assholes. This, uh, this is, we're turning to shit. It's insane that the government is, is going into, going into guys, little bodegos now and telling them you're going to get a summons for not uh for leaving your front door open nobody should pay any of those nobody should fucking write a check do anything all now, at once but you've been on stage right last time i saw you you were heading to uh texas i think or somewhere to do some shows i've been right? to, i've been to texas three times i've been to nashville two times i've been to arizona i've been to salt lake city and that's you that's just, like harlow and monte Carla. Oh, that's right. That's just, but I haven't been to me, Mike. That's I've, right. I've done corporate <laughs> gigs. I've flown Southwest uh, more than I ever have. Uh, I've, I've done everything. I, it doesn't matter to me, but, uh, okay, let's, let's focus on, on you and the, uh, in the doc. Um, <clears throat> uh, you got yes. some of the biggest names out there in this. I can't believe there has, there never been a documentary on the comedy store. Cause it seems like such a great subject. Um, I think there, there's been specials in the comedy store. I think there was like a E true Hollywood thing on the comedy store. I don't think 
I mean, I spent two years working on this thing, you know, this is, I did a deep dive on it. I, you know, I think um, Showtime let me do this right. You know, I think, you know, I think this is the first one with this kind of depth to it or whatever, but I, I don't, you know, I don't think on this level it's been done because it's a great story. It is, it's 50 years, 40, 48 years, the comedy store has been around and, you know, it had a few tough years business wise, but it's really, um, it's really kind of Mecca for comedians. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really interesting how it's the center of the world of stand up. What were some of the lean years? What were some of the off years for the comedy store? Um, I would say 2000 to 2010, nine, somewhere really? in there. Those, but I mean, they weren't all real horrible, but that those were that was the bad decade, you know. Really, I wouldn't I wouldn't have thought that, but I wouldn't have known what era to pick. Why was that? Why was it bad? Um, I think a lot of it was that a big part of it was that Mitzi was really sick, the owner Mitzi Shore, and they didn't really know how they wanted to run the store without her. I think um, uh, the other comedians went to other clubs. I think because there was no one really running the club, a lot of comedians kind of just came in and took over the place and would just go on all night, you know, big, there were four or five comics that were the big names of the era and they would come in all night and do like long sets, you know, and it just wasn't a well-run room. And um, I think the social media hadn't really kind of picked up to the place where they could really advertise and they weren't use it as a way to gin up business. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an interesting, it's actually this Sunday night is this, the, the, the episode that really toes how it came back and how it really came back is Joe Rogan and the podcasters brought it back, you know? Right. And, and the social, social media, you know, and Joe Rogan was banned for about seven years from the club. Yeah. Why was, know? why was that? Well, he got in this fight with this comic named Carlos Mencia. Oh, was, right, right. Who who w was taking the guy's material. Well, he was taking know? other comedians' materials, but not Joe specifically? Not Joe specifically, but none of them were standing up to him. And Joe, one night, went up on stage and just uh, accused him of it. And they got in this fight on stage, and someone filmed it. And they, it went, they put it on the internet and it, it became this viral kind of sensation. And they banned Joe for doing that. Um, and, he, and Joe lost his agent and, you know, he lost a lot of, a lot of bookings and stuff. And, but the fact is, you know, seven years later, he kind of came back and he had, he, at the time he had built up his, his, his podcast and a lot of that. And, and um, he brought back Joey Diaz and he brought back oh, Andrew Santino and Chris D'Elia and all those guys, you know, and uh, Bill Burr and Whitney Cummings, I guess. And, I, 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 you know, there's a whole list of them. But th that kind of slowly, a lot of what happened was Adam Egget, the booker, who kind of, there was a, a, a change of hands. There was another guy named Tommy that was booking it who wasn't really popular with a whole group of comedians. Who He was kind of the guy that backed Carlos over Joe. And when he was gone, then I think Joe felt like, okay, it's time to come back. What is the status of that property? I know Polly is an owner. I know he has a brother or two, or maybe a two sister. brothers, two the brothers, two Shore, Shore brothers. You know, the Shore family, I, I knew them really well. I, I came out here from Detroit when I was 18 and I got a job as a doorman and I babysat Peter and Paul. That was my day job. And, um, you know, and then 
they had a sister, Sandy, and an older brother, Scott, who at that time had already gone off to college. But two years ago, Mitzi died, their father, Scotty, died, and their sister, Sandy, died all within one year. Wow. So so it's now the three brothers. And Paul Peter, the middle brother, he runs it. He's the businessman. And it's funny because he runs it from Oregon, where he lives. He's also... He's a pretty incredible guy. He 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 works for the um, uh, uh, a veterans administration, and he runs the comedy store. <laughs> wow! Then, and he's a novelist, <laughs> you know. So he's doing. He does a lot. So is there? Is there? But is there a feud? Is there drama? Is there? Is there legal proceedings? Does somebody want to sell it? Somebody want to develop it? Somebody want to? No, pres- not anymore. That's all been. That's all. You know, I, I don't really like to get into the family's business because it's not. You know, it is family business. But the truth is, that's all been settled. It really, it really, in the last year and a half, it, it has all been worked out. Not in a legal way. They've on their <laughs> own out, just kind of sat down amongst themselves and worked it all out. And they were dealing with lawyers, but they did it on themselves, and it's they've made a deal and, and, you know, Peter runs the place and Paulie's very happy. I was with Paulie last night. He's very happy. And Scott's, you know, down in San Diego doing what he's always done in the real estate business. And, and Peter is, is running the place. All right. So it'll, it'll remain the comedy store as we know always, it for always, the so- yeah. foreseeable future. Yes. Uh, for you, what are you off to? Uh, more docs, features? Oh, I, I had never done a doc before this one. I never wanted to do a doc until they called me and asked me to do this one. I'm going to do another feature, yeah. And um, I, I would. There is another doc I'd like to do, and um, and um, I'd like to do some more docs on comedy. I, I think you know I, I left comedy for a long time. I I would never want to do it again. But I have really rekindled a a love for it in the sense that there's another version of a documentary that I'd like to do about stand up. But more is about more going back and making movies. It's, uh, I mean, docs are great. Docs about comedians are great. Docs about stand up are great. I mean, it's, it's a perfect subject for a, a documentary. I think I was just watching one on uh, The Amazing Jonathan. You guys, uh, there's, there's two good ones. Yeah, I think there's there's two. It's kind of crazy. Maybe I just saw three quarters of it on a plane. But anybody who mm. becomes a recognizable name as a stand-up or a comedian magician or whatever it is, all you got to do is dig through that person's shoebox a little bit and you're going to have an entertaining well, but as you know, because you've made some great docs, you, the, you've got to keep, it's just like a movie. You've got to keep telling a story. Yes. You've got to keep telling a story. The, the, the minute the story stops, the movie stops. But the difference, and it's very similar. If you're making a, a doc about a musician, you got great music. But if you're making a doc about a comedian or com- comedians, you got great comedy if you use it, you know, and that's the upside. All right. Let me uh, take a minute and hit uh, simply oh, did I safe do something air. Wrong? No, I'm just sitting. Uh-huh. Sim- uh-huh. It just feels like I did something just wrong. Just paying some bills. Simply safe. Most home security companies trap you with high prices, tricky contracts, lousy customer support. There's only one no brainer. That's simply safe. Two eyes in there. Everything to protect your home. An arsenal of sensors and cameras for every room, window, and door, tailored specifically for your home. Professional monitoring, monitoring day and night, ready to uh, send police, fire, medical professionals if you need to. Set up in under an hour, just peel and stick. No technician required. No contract, pushy sales guys, hidden fees, or fine prints. Starts at uh, just 15 bucks a month. U.S. News and World Report named it best overall home security of 2020. It's Simply Safe, right, Dawson? Head to simplysafe.com slash Adam and get a free HD camera for our listeners. That's simplysafe.com slash Adam to make sure they know our show sent you. So, uh, Mike Binder, that is, with the five part docu series, The Comedy Store, 
you talk to Letterman, you talk to Mandel, you talk to Rock, you talk to Rogan Corolla. and Corolla and all the all the all the massive <laughs> names, all the, all the luminaries, greats. all the legendaries. Um, who did you uh, who who'd you like in, in the interview? Who were you surprised by? Like I'm looking at a name here, for instance, which is uh, Yakov Smirnov, right? And I used to make fun of Yakov Smirnov because I thought he was sort of a novelty comedian. He is the most genuine, sweetest, warmest person on the planet. Like he is yes, such is. a sweetheart, right? He's a very real guy. I, I've known him forever. I've known him from day one in show business for both of us. So I, I do like him and I like him a lot. And he's very real. And and um, he has a lot, of, he, you know, he, he he's... He got very emotional at one point. You know, he has a lot of love for the place, right. as do I. You know, and and uh, I, I there was I like there was a lot I liked. You know, there was a lot I didn't like. You know, a few people came in and just blew me away with their kind of, you know, kind of cynicism, and and I wasn't looking for that. That's not what I wanted to do. You know, and um, can you name any then, name any of those people? Uh, Hitler and. <laughs> um, uh, no, no. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter because they didn't make the doc. They, oh. they, I didn't put them in, you know, mm. but I um, mean, they were, they're just, they were sort of cynical or their attitude was poor or what, what was yeah, it? They just, they just wanted to flamethrow, you know, and, and uh, scores. yeah, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, they were kind of bitter about the way the world turned out, you know, and, uh, I wasn't looking to do as you can see, if you ever see it, uh, 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 a Hallmark thing, because it's not all, I, I showed a lot of the the cracks and crevices, but by the same token, I wasn't, I was trying to talk about why this, why comedians need a home club, why comedians even care about a place. Well, you know, they're all, you know, uh, why, why it is comedians is such a solo job, why, why do they need a place that they gravitate to and show that how, what it was about this place that became like the spot that you want to kind of have your name on the wall, you know? The, uh, the fourth episode is going to air uh, this Sunday, 10 PM on uh, showtime. I'm going to watch every one. I'm, I'm in one or two of them. I, I imagine. You're in, you're in, I think you're in three of them. Three of them. Boy, yeah. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, oh, let's see. Oh, this this episode is going to highlight the uh, Joe Rogan uh, comeback story or Mencia story. So yeah, says uh, yeah. Max Zapata. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Well, we will be watching uh, Mike Binder. Oh. Uh, yes, go ahead, Brian. Before we disconnect here, I want to take a left turn if there's a, if just a couple minutes. Mike, uh, you were in, as an actor, one of my favorite movies, quietly one of my favorite movies, Minority Report, and you played a crucial key character with yeah. hardly any screen time. I and mean, you might have been on the screen for two minutes, but it was really impactful. It was uh, a really uh, dynamic character. Can you just talk about your experience? I, I really love that movie. I think it's underrated. I'd like to know what your experience was uh, working with Spielberg or doing getting ready for a part that was fairly despicable. You know, you, you, you were set up to be a, a de facto bad guy. Yeah, Leo Crow. Yeah, uh, yeah. That was a fun time, you know. I was, I was actually doing... Uh, Mine is a married man at the time, and and um, I just got a call out of nowhere to do that. I was on it longer than two minutes with the screen time, which was weird because I I mean all these other things on the walls, oh, you yeah, know. That's and, right. and uh, but it was great, and it was Steven Spielberg and Tom Cruise, and it was fun. And uh, the one cool story that I have on that one is you know we shot this this scene in downtown Los Angeles in this apartment building where Cruz shoots the gun and I go flying out the window, you know, out the, uh, out, out the uh, glass window, uh, out 30 floors below. And uh, we shot with him and I fighting over the gun all morning. And then they were gonna have the stunt guy go, they had a, a, a giant foam pad just about two stories below on a crane and he was going to go flying out dressed as me, you know, just 
hairpiece looks like me, everything, da da da. And uh, I come back from lunch and and you know we they they those guys are a lot of fun and we'd all been joking around and and I hear him arguing, no no no, Tom goes, he can do it, Michael do it, <laughs> Michael do it, I. And Stephen goes, no, it's I don't think he he will, he's not gonna want it. And I go, what are you guys talking about? He goes, Tom goes, I I think you should just do the stunt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've done every stunt in every one of my yeah. movies and it's going to look fake if you don't do it. And Stephen goes, I don't think so. And, and, and is the DP, they're all fucking goading me. And Tom goes, look out, just look out the window. Look at that giant big foam pad. It's just going to be fun. You're going to just land like on a trampoline and, and it'll, it's going to be so much realer and it's going to look phony and crappy if you don't do it. I just can't believe you wouldn't do it. I'm like this kid in high school. Well, okay, I guess I'll do it if you, and Steven goes, okay, thanks, Mike. That's great. And they, they start <laughs> hooking me guy. up. They, they start, and then all of a sudden, Cruz goes, all right, well, just be careful though. Don't land this part here on your neck because you'll die instantly. And, uh, <laughs> and all of a sudden he starts laughing and I realize these fucking guys, they, they just suck me in, you know? Like a like a little high school kid that wanted to be in the gang so bad, you know. <laughs> they were doing a uh, Martin Lewis routine, trying to get you to uh, to oh, do the stunt. And they did, they did. I was I was gonna do it. I, I was peeing in my pants, but I was gonna do it. Did you do it? Did you land? No, it? no, oh, no. They just they just gaslit you all the way. They, they would have never let me do it. Yes. It would have been illegal <laughs> to let me do it. It would, you know. There's just no way. It was uh, worth it for the story. <laughs> Mike Binder, uh, thanks for joining us, man. We'll talk soon, and I'll be watching. Thanks so much for having me on, you guys. I really appreciate it. And, 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 and Adam, thanks for being a part of the doc. You, my really were, you helped out a lot. I'm, really uh, it was my honor. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back with the news right after this. Give me the news with Grad. News with Gino Grad. Great. Viral, all those crazy Trump tweets. Give me news with Gina Grad. Trouble in the Middle East. Celebrity drunk meltdowns. Need news with Gina Gina Grad. The news with Gina Grad. Well, first it was uh, Jeffrey Tubin, and now Rudy Giuliani. What's going on, everybody? One of the stars of the new Borat movie, which is out this week is Rudy Giuliani, and this is getting some hot press. So in the film, a woman invites Giuliani to her hotel bedroom for drinks after doing what he thought was a real interview regarding Trump's response to coronavirus. And during the run-in, Giuliani is seen, we have a picture, trying to remove his microphone, assisted by actress Maria Bakalova, who plays Borat's daughter. And Giuliani reclines on the bed, puts his hands down his pants while the actress playing Borat's teenage daughter stands in front of him. Then Borat runs into the room shouting, she's 15. She's too old for you. <laughs> and this is getting a lot of That's hype. <laughs> this is getting a lot of hype, obviously, because it looks like, you know, Rudy doesn't know, you know, he's being filmed and that this is fake. And he tweeted, the Borat video is a complete fabrication. I was tucking in my shirt after taking off the recording equipment. At no time during or after the interview was I ever inappropriate as he lounges back on his bed with his hand down. I don't know if it's a complete level. fabrication. He's in the room. Yeah. <laughs> it's not CGI. Do we have a clip or do they? No. Oh, I'm they just showing you the still. They haven't, uh... It comes out the day this episode airs. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, I'm going to watch. Uh, what's <laughs> it on? Showtime? I think it's Amazon Prime. It's Amazon Prime. Yeah, he says, I don't know, I don't know what the fuck he's doing in a hotel room with the with that chick. He says they pulled the mic out and he's tucking his shirt back in. I don't yeah. know if it means he's rubbing his junk or, or not. I don't I don't think he's rub he's seventy six. How good is your junk at seventy six? It worked pretty good? You gotta rub it a long time, I don't imagine. Rub it a while. Mm -hmm. They have pills for that. Oh, okay. You know what, though? I mean, mm. I, I'm going to watch this movie. I love all of Sasha's characters that nobody can debate that he's, you know, he's a genius. But I'm a little afraid to watch it because the older I get, the less I like to watch prank stuff. Yeah, I get and uncomfortable. Really uncomfortable. Yeah. So, like, if it's Giuliani or a high profile figure, that's one thing. But, like, just your everyday guy that you're kind of exposing it, it just makes me, um, I don't know, it makes me very uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of with you the same way. I feel bad sometimes. I feel uncomfortable in uh, 
prank stuff feels weird. Although new season of uh, Crank Anchors coming up. Uh, <laughs> just got That's the news. Different. Just got the Those news on that. Those damn puppets are adorable. So uh, you guys got to. I got to get some good Bertram themes going. I just found out. I I just found out we're doing Zoom sessions. I don't even know. Oh. I don't even know how that works anymore. But that's that's uh that's the new world order. But also with crank anchors, there's there's such a level of anonymity for the person on the other end. You don't see their face. We don't know where they are necessarily. They're not. You know, it's it's it doesn't feel as invasive as I, something like this. I used to hate. We used to do those on the Man Show, hidden camera shit. Yeah. And it's I oh it was always uncomfortable. Like it's funny, but it's uncomfortable. Max yeah, Pat, there's an episode of the Man Show, a bit we've never done, I think, where I uh I got a job. I was posing as a gas station attendant. <laughs> and it was all hidden camera shit. And I was the gas station attendant and I was just fucking with old rich people. And I felt uncomfortable the the entire time. On the other on the other hand, if you don't sell out, you won't get the comedy. That's it, true. That's true. If you kind of half ass it, then you might as well just not do it because yeah. you, you can just throw the whole fucking thing away if you just half ass it. So unfortunately, there is no. You have to kind of go for the jugular, otherwise it's not going to be usable. Well, and on the other hand, like, you know, from being uncomfortable, the the signing up for the band Women's Suffrage is hilarious. And I could watch that one over and over again. So there's just like when you have a mark and you're super hyper exposing that person, it's just hard to watch. But, well, you know, the, that kind of stuff. The different. thing that was funny about the uh, end women's suffrage is we had a crew. I mean, we had a <laughs> big dude. A big cameraman with the full unit, the big beta unit, right. like on his shoulder, like the old news crews would have. And I remember one time, one of the irate guys, I like when the guys get irate. I like when guys get irate on women's behalf. And I like when white women get irate on women, ethnic women's behalf. Mm -hmm. I like when people do that cross pollinization of, of I am, uh, I'm defending you because I'm a hero. And I remember very clearly one of the guys going, this is a joke. What is this? A joke? Some guy? What is some kind of hidden camera show? And it's like, no, the guy, <laughs> the guy six three with the the guy with the waffle stompers, and the shorts that have zippers uh, midway up the leg. That that's huge camera. That's that's what we're filming you with. It's not a hidden camera show. All right, sorry, Jim. So we will all look forward to that. And I'm sure we'll have lots to say about it. Can I'm, I ask you guys a philosophical question about yeah. the, the hidden camera? Or not the hidden camera, sorry. The prank stuff. I'm with you. Like, it's just there are certain things, you know, feel icky or uncomfortable. However, does it, as I can say, I can tell you for me, it does. Does it for you guys feel very satisfactory when I'm thinking specifically of the uh, scene in Borat number one, where he's with the uh, racist uh, frat guys from South Carolina in their uh, mini or in their uh, RV. And uh, he's asking them what's wrong with the country. And they're like immigrants and you know, all this, all this racist shit. And uh, these fucking assholes tried to sue Borat and the judge fucking tossed it out. I was like, get out here. They, they, they claim their claim was uh, they got, Got us drunk, and uh, they promised us it would never be shown in the U.S. That's not a defense, but however, did it not does it not feel satisfying when like the assholes get theirs? I guess I think it's it's a defense if they say you're if they get you drunk and they say they're not going to show it in the U.S. and they do. I mean, if they say, I think they proved their case. Uh, yeah, they probably didn't prove it. Oh, we got the yeah. I'm. I like it. Look, listen, I like when John Stossel would bust the <laughs> shitty transmission shop right. for Gouch and well, Geller. Like I'm, I'm all I'm all about that. Don't don't get me wrong. This is uh, this is one we've never done before. I think it's a yeah. uh, gas station. Season four, the man show. Season four, the man show. Me Howdy, ma'am. Howdy, sir. Howdy, ma'am. Howdy, sir. You want me to pump that for you? there ma'am i don't need a five cents oh. happy motoring oh, i think i undid her battery <laughs> i think you flooded it ma'am yeah ma'am i can just try it for me ah, 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 no. 
See, that's what I felt bad about. <laughs> Poor little Asian lady. What are you doing? You My hand was in the fan belt. Oh. Oh. She didn't seem happy about she it. She is concerned. Aston Martin DB7. This is That's way too much car for you broads. <laughs> oh. All right. She's this is visual. At, this... at what point did you tell them? Because I imagine they had to sign something. Oh, God. I can't even remember. I just. all I, You did tell them. All I remember is. That, oh, God. Yeah, you had to tell everyone and had to get them to sign. I just remember this one old lady who came by and <laughs> she was on empty, right? And so I pulled the, I said, I'll fill it up for you. And she said, fine. And I put the thing in and I gave her like half a gallon and then I clicked it. And I'm like, all right, well, there it is. Buck 75. You'll be on your way. And she was like, uh, I was on empty. This car holds 18 gallons. I'm like, well, it clicked. And she's like, well, do it again. And I'm like, uh, by federal law, I can't because the clicking means it's topped off. She's like, topped off? It's 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 a ga- You put a gallon in my tank. And then I, I started getting hush. I was like, oh, I'll tell you what. Don't tell anybody. Just drive away. Just drive away like this didn't happen. And then just Pretend circle, like circle the block and then come back. Because you come back, I can start with a fresh tank. Okay. I can't go top it off. She's like, top it off. <laughs> You didn't put any gas in. I know, I know, but it clicked. The click doesn't lie. It clicked. Just pretend. You know what? People are looking at us now. Just drive off, come back, and I'll try it again. And I remember, I just remember that sort of insane, uh, that insane scenario. All right, what else you got, Gina Graham? All right. Well, the Washington football team, formerly known as the Redskins, won't be choosing a new name anytime soon. When the team dropped its racially insensitive name, the front office said it would take some time before considering a new name. Apparently, they need more time. Team president Jason Wright says there's a pretty good chance the franchise will just continue to be called the Washington football team through next season. He says it's important to engage the community and fans. We're also in the process of identifying the folks that should weigh in over time. We want this name and brand to represent the entire area, to represent the fan base, but to also attract new folks to this fan base. We want to grow this fan base as part of our new identity. Well, let's not let what happened to that 70s show happen to the Washington football organization. Because that 70s show, they had names for it. Like it was called like Teenage Wasteland and and blah, blah, blah. But they kept referring to it as that 70s show. Like it, it was, it was just on the card, you know, and it, you know, mm-hmm. they go, we got to get a name for the seven, for that 70 yeah. show. We got to come up with a name for it. And they just kept doing it and kept doing it, and kept doing it. Eventually they just went, oh, fuck it. It's called that 70 show. <laughs> so that could very well happen with the yeah. Washington football yeah. team. Right. Brian, you might know this. Isn't that how Cloverfield got its name for the movie? I'm not sure about that, but that level of complacency, yes, is dangerous. When it comes to the <laughs> next thing you know, you're the Washington football team forever. Right. Yeah, Cloverfield was the name of the street that Bad Robot was on, so that was their right. code name, and they just ended up keeping <sighs> it. They just ended up keeping it. Uh, so, what else? Well, some good TV news, hopefully. A Smokey and the Bandit TV show is oh, in the works. Oh, yeah! Not many details other than it's being developed by Seth MacFarlane. Mm. along with David Gordon Green and Danny McBride (laughs) and the creative team over uh, at HBO that does Eastbound and Down, which is one of the greatest shows of all time. Uh, It's interesting since the title seems to be uh, inspired by Smokey and the Bandit and Eastbound and Down is the name of the show. uh, The song, yeah. 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 It's unclear if the show will have any formal connection to the movie, but the TV show is in the work. So you now, Adam, have to go find out what's going on with Seth. Well, not since uh, BJ and the Bear have I been this excited about a trucker's <laughs> movie. Uh, a TV show. Yeah, a TV show, a series. Oh. I don't know. I Look, this may seem like a long shot. Can we get Daniel Day-Lewis to play Snowman? <laughs> I'm, I'm spitballing, people. Yeah, yeah think you big. ask, ask you got, Well, you, you, know, you don't get an answer unless yeah. you ask. You miss all the shots you don't take. 
I was watching uh, Alex Gibney's new documentary, uh, Totally Under Control, the other day uh, about uh, COVID and all that stuff. And uh, the scene where they started to distribute the, uh, the, the PPE scored to Convoy. Oh, nothing better. Wow. Pretty great. <laughs> How crazy. Think about this. Think about the power of cinema in the 70s. You know, no one has a monopoly on anything anymore. Right. It's all there's two million channels. There's two million docs. There's, two, right. there's cable and YouTube. You don't no one really has that monopoly anymore. But cinema <clears throat> in the 70s had a kind of monopoly. And, you know, they put out a handful of movies and you had to watch those movies. Those were the movies that came to your local theater. And those are the movies you and your parents went and watched. Cinema was so powerful for about this this two or three year period in the mid to later 70s, that they made Truck Driver a glamorous superhero, lady killer, ass-kicking, tight Plays by his own rules. job. They took yeah, the rebel. job of driving a fucking truck <laughs> and turned it into somewhere between like a sheriff and a stuntman. <laughs> I, what... Now, I don't know how far truck driver have fallen down the sort of cool hero chain of command, but uh, oh, the mighty have fallen. And I'm just saying, look, I got nothing against truck drivers. I got nothing against poultry farmers either. But it, how, we took these guys and turned them into fucking heroes. There was, there was Convoy. There was a movie just called CB. There was a movie with Jan Michael Vincent called White Line Fever where he was truck. I mean, there was all these hero and, of course, Smoking the Bandit. There's these, like, hero trucker movies. It's, it's, it's pretty insane that you could do that. On the other hand, you had, you had society by the fucking short hairs. Like, I'm going to make a trucking movie. We're going to put it at the Lorena, the Guild, and the El Portal Theater for a year. And an 11-year-old Adam Carolla... What are you going to do? Talk to your parents? Yeah. What choice do you have? What choice do you have? You're Don't watching. Don't forget over the top. Oh, over the top. Yeah. All right. White Line. Could you find the trailer for White Line Fever? Because I'll probably laugh your ass off. And double entendre. We are going to make, yeah, we are going to make a, a primetime series called BJ and the Bear. And uh, it'll be about a guy. He's a trucker. He's got a monkey. His monkey is his navigator. And uh, he's got these two hot blonde uh, twin friends, and uh, they're called Stacks because they got big jugs. There you go. Sounds like primetime ABC yeah. to me. Green light it. Green light it. All right. Sorry, Gina. What, oh, do we have the. Oh, we have it. White Line Fever. White Line Fever, 1975 trailer. <laughs> Carol Joe is back. Jerry waited two long years. Now it's time to make a life for themselves. He's getting married, driving a truck, feeling good about himself. He's an honest trucker who won't make deals. You're not I cutting mean, I deals. Have stuff I don't drive, huh? That's right. Just keep your mouth shut and do as you're told. He's does what he ran him off the road. Boy, what pass for entertainment back there. Whoa, they're shooting at him. Right. Pregnant Carol Joe. All right. It froze out of the points. You can imagine two hours of this. Oh, boy. Guess who has a small part in this? Who? Martin Cove. Oh. Really? <laughs> yes, yeah, that's right. That's great. Wait, are you telling me, because I don't know anything about this movie, it's called White Line Fever and he doesn't have a Coke problem? No, but oh. I, I was 10 years old and I had a problem because I had to watch <laughs> this movie in the movie theater because what were my choices? Nothing. Stay home and shit in a That's popcorn it. tin or go nah, to Nah, that wasn't for a number of years, but thank no. you. Come on. Come on, Gina. It's your future. All right, what else we got, Gina? Pope Francis just made a huge departure from previous Vatican doctrine. He's endorsing gay civil unions. In a documentary that aired in Rome Wednesday, he urged governments to give gay couples the same rights that heterosexual couples have. He says they got no choice. 
<laughs> homosexuals have a right to be a part of a family. They're children of God. They have a right to a family. Nobody should be thrown out or be made miserable because of it. It's a documentary called Francesco. Also addresses issues like um, growing rich, the growing rich poor gap, racism, climate change, and sexual abuse. This is the People's Pope. Fun. Jesus Christ. Is nothing sacred anymore. <laughs> Everybody's in the act. The Pope. The Everyone's getting into the act. They're all getting into the act. I What's don't know. The act in this case. The act is progressive, you know, cause oriented. I, I just feel like, I don't know. I just want the vicar of Christ with the thing, with the smoke coming out of it that he's going to, oh, sure. you know, going yeah, back and around. Side to side yeah, the it. nunchucks, the smoking nunchucks, the big vicar cap on there with the, you know, oh, you know, blessing people and, you know, oh, making mommy, the, party. yeah, it's just doing the thing with the fingers and the water and stuff. I, I just kind of miss that. I don't, uh, I think he probably does that too. Yeah. I just don't like everyone getting so hip and progressive. I like, I like some old school stuff. I don't want, uh, I, 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 I want like, I want Disneyland to be, I, I want the old pirates of the Caribbean. I want the mm, ones where the, where the pirates is where pirates chasing the wench around in a in a circle. I, I miss right. I miss that. I feel I feel like uh, it's old school. It's a right. casserole. What, what this what this story doesn't say is that documentary. He actually announced that on the Joe Rogan podcast. Oh, he did. Yeah, and then they made sorry, a documentary out of that. Oh, really? Yeah, that's oh, the way wow. he released this information. Interesting. All right, Gina, get ready with your next uh, right. show and uh, your next story. And let me hit uh, Butcher Box here. Hard to find 100% grass fed and finished beef, free range organic chicken, heritage breed pork, or wild caught salmon at the grocery store. Today's sponsor, Butcher Box, thinks you should uh, have one less trip to the uh, grocery store. Better, more affordable selection. We use Butcher Box almost every night. It's all good. The chicken's good. The pork's good. The beef's amazing. Each box has between 9 and 11 pounds of meat, enough for 24 individual meals around, uh, just around 6 bucks a meal, packed fresh, shipped frozen, vacuum sealed, free shipping nationwide except for Alaska and Hawaii. And right now, members get two lobster tails and two filet mignon free in their first box. That's two lobster tails and two filet mignon free in your first box. Just go to butcherbox.com slash Adam and save and get those lobster tails, surf and turf and the filet mignon. That's butcherbox.com slash Adam. What else, Gina? Well, we have a Banksy painting that has sold, Ooh. and I will show you the painting and tell you a little bit about it, and you can go ahead and guess what it's sold for. Did it shred itself? Mm -hmm. Not yet. You never know with these when they're set to go off. So it's a take on Claude Monet's masterpiece, um, uh, the uh, bridge over a pond of water lilies. And it has that vibe and it has that impressionist vibe, but there's uh, a t overturned couple of grocery carts in there, a road cone, and it looks a little bit different. This is called um, uh, Show Me the Monet. Mm -hmm. That's the name of this piece. And it did sell for quite a bit. Um, I mean, you're really looking at everything I can explain. It's it's the water lily picture with two overturned shopping carts and a road cone. How what do they do validate this actually by Banksy? Because I'm going to say this. Feels a little on the nose. Banksy's a little, a little more clever, a little mm. more interesting. This is like, all right. Well, for this price, they must have gotten a certificate of authenticity. 3.7 million. Okay. I take the over. I'm going to go four and a half. 9.8 million. Jesus wow. Christ. In a nine minute bidding battle, according to Sotheby's. Nine minutes, it got to almost $10 million. Must have done all that. You know, all this stuff is now just going on, going off virtually. You know, right. they're just doing all the bidding over the phone and all the whatever. E evidently, all this, we need to show up and do that, whether it came to pitch meetings or meetings or conference meetings or whatever bidding on cars or paintings kind of turns out we didn't need to be there. Yeah. No one really needed to be there. You know what I, I've been saying about that for a long time and now they're finally on board. I've been saying that about doctor's appointments forever. 
Mm. I'm like, are you sure? I just, I, I can tell you what my symptoms are sitting in my house, in my pajamas with my tea sneezing, or I can go there and sneeze on you and tell you the same thing. Nope. Sorry. You got to come in. You got to come in. We don't have an availability till next Thursday. Well, now everyone's doing teledoc. Thank God. Yeah. Not for gynecologist appointments. Cause that's hard to get the camera in there, but <laughs> it seems, well, that's what the selfie stick is for. That's mm. right. Make sure you got the right end of it. Um, the, it, here's the point. Probably 70% of, of those kinds of questions and visits and things could be done in that sort of teleconferencing kind of way. Obviously, there's a, a percentage that can't. And for that, people should go in. But imagine yep. how much space and time and equipment and everything we could save. And by the way, how many more people that doctor could see. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, let's if, if anything good is to come out of this, maybe that. That would be it. All right, let's do one more, Gina Gran. All right. So attention beer drinkers who like their Guinness, but maybe are trying to cut back on being drunk so much of the day. Uh, Guinness is known for their dark Irish stout from Dublin. They are launching Guinness 0, 0.0, the company's first alcohol-free beverage, according to Fox News. It's a non-alcoholic uh, uh, okay. Guinness. These are dark days. Yeah, uh, it said that it argument... Is like, um, do you enjoy being fat and do you and enjoy caring about it? Oh, because yeah. Because when you're fat and drunk, you're fat, but you don't care. You're happy. When you're fat and sober, you know it. Yeah. Yeah, that just seems lose, lose to me. Well, you know, you talk about commercials and it's a good way to sort of see which way the wind is blowing. And before the pan now, now alcohol sales have been on the rise since the pandemic. So we kind of have to take the last seven, eight months out of it. But there were so many news stories before that, that millennials aren't drinking and that so many of these like, you know, bespoke alcoholic beverages are being made virgin and that the, the younger people aren't buying as much alcohol that Guinness probably caught wind of this and thought, well, we got to appeal to everybody you know we, we don't want to lose money with the with the older crowd dying off so i'm sure it was a business decision uh, with that tracking but it says it's beautifully smooth perfectly balanced dark color of guinness it just uh won't get you buzzed i just feel like it's a ton of carbs minus any oh, sure. buzz oh uh, yes I, don't, uh, I could see buying a can and then filling it with real guinness and then driving <laughs> Was that their plan? That's the only plan I would have. Does this <laughs> so sound right appealing now, to anybody? Zero. No. Zero. Uh, zero uh, point zero. Recovering alcoholics, maybe? I I guess. Uh, hair of the dog. Who's but, the market? Who's the market for this? That's what I'm saying. I think it's millennials, I'm guessing. Because that's who's not buying alcohol. No, yeah, I'm just making a face. <laughs> I'm make, I got a puss on. I got to because I'm picturing just sort of tasting it and going, nothing's happening. Yeah, if you're going to do that, you'd rather have a chocolate milkshake. Yeah, I, I think I would. Well, there's better options. I would rather, I, if I was going to take in those kinds of carbs, I'd, I'd definitely whip myself up a, a nice uh, sarsaparilla milkshake. Sarsaparilla, Ooh, sarsaparilla milkshake. I'm telling you, I don't even know if you can do it anymore, but when I was a kid, when I was in high school, there was a place called Swenson's. You guys remember oh, yeah. Swenson's? Yeah. Swens Swenson was an ice cream parlor, you know? And the problem with everything now is like, we sell ice cream, but we also sell truck tires and we also sell batteries and we also sell uh, taquitos. And it's like, uh, there's something about an ice cream parlor, like a dedicated ice cream parlor. They're not cooking anything up. It's just ice cream. So you are going to get the best. And, and, and I used to order, they had something at Swenson's called a coit tower. That was like a, a Sunday with the different whatever's on it. I think we would go there very quaintly Friday nights after the football game. It was across from Dupar's in that parking lot in Studio City. And one time or two times I went there and I just ordered a milkshake. And I think I used Vanilla ice cream, but I had them flavor it with sarsaparilla. Ooh. And so it had this root, this strong root beer taste. And I like a root beer float, but I like the texture of the shake better, of the malt or the shake better. So this was the 
texture of a milkshake, but tasted like a root beer float. Pretty damn killer. You're in luck. There's one in San Francisco and one in Midland, Texas. Ooh, all right. Pack it up. We're going to Midland. Yeah, it probably started in San Francisco. Maybe it was around that Ghirardelli area or something. But anyway, um, do yourself a favor and get yourself a nice sarsaparilla float. I think they just add the flavor to it. All right, Gina, let's bring it home. I'm drooling. You got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. All right. Quick 15 seconds for our friends over at Simply Safe. No one should feel unsafe at home, period. And that's where Simply Safe comes in. Their mission from day one is to keep you safe. Simply Safe, two eyes.com slash Adam. All right. Live events West Palm Beach, Florida, November 20th and 21st. Five shows. Because we're doing a matinee with uh, a reasonable doubt on Saturday. Mark Garagos is flying our asses out there. And uh, we'll do the early show as the uh, live pod. The later show is going to be stand-up, so go out and check that out. I'm your emotional support animal. Available as we speak. Get that. Write a review. I will read it. You can check out our YouTube channel. Subscribe to my channel at youtube.com slash Adam. I want to thank uh, Mike Binder for zooming in. The five-part docuseries, The Comedy Store, it's available now on uh, Showtime. And until next time, this is Adam Kroll for Mike Binder and Bald and Gina say mahalo. <laughs> <laughs>